Hello, thanks for joining me again for another of our weekly studies through the Book of Romans together. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 15 today as Paul brings this whole final section that began in chapter 12 to a conclusion. And he wants us to remember the powerful lesson that he's been focusing on of this transformed life that we have in Jesus Christ and what we are we need to do to truly live that way. And what we want to be able to focus on today is then how do we bring that all about? What is the one and to whom we look to and listen to as we focus on our life together in Jesus Christ. So let me get this, the share going for you. And as Paul's been focusing on this transformed mind and all the things that it uh, entails, he has in the back of his mind the example that he wants us all to be following, and that is that of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, because we've already seen, he's talked about it back in chapter 7 himself, that he struggles with doing what he should do and doing what he wants to do. And this is a struggle we all have. And so he, as he brings it to a conclusion, he says, I want to remind you of where we're going with this, and that is with the mind of Christ. And I referred to this in a lesson Sunday uh, from the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai, while he is training and trying to uh, battle this master uh, samurai. He is told, uh, you have too many mind, mind the sword, mind the people watch, mind the enemy, too many mind, no mind. And what he's being told there is to get rid of all those other distractions, remove them from your brain so that you can focus on the task at hand and really do what needs to be done and not just reacting to all these other things that are going on. And we don't want to take the example to the extreme of, you know, Paul's not telling us just to have no mind and don't think at all, but he is telling us to try to transform our mind into the mind of Christ. And that is his focus here in chapter 15, uh, the first 13 verses. So since chapter 12, he's been talking about this transformed mind, the metamorphosis that takes place by the Holy Spirit. It is a mind that seeks God's good and perfect will. It is one that is full of humility and deep love for one another. It lives at peace and does good. Uh, as much as this is, is possible to, with us, that's what we focus on. And it all centers around the uh, concept that love does no harm to its neighbor because love is the fulfillment of the law. All of these things are demonstrated in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. And so as we come to chapter 15, Paul focuses in on that beautiful mind of Christ that we are all seeking. And while we've talked over a couple of decades now, uh, we've used the cute little saying of what would Jesus do? That's exactly where Paul goes down in chapter 50. Not just what would Jesus do? He focuses on what did Jesus do and why did he do it? And that is the focus throughout. And through these 13 verses, he goes back and forth between uh, their responsibility and what's, what he wants them to do and what Jesus did and why he did it. And so I'm going to split it up that way and focus first on what Jesus did and why. Uh, he's already mentioned at the end of chapter 13 that he wants them to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think uh, about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Clothe yourself with Jesus. Now he's think like him. 
especially as he's been focusing in chapter 14 on the way in which they relate to each other, specifically uh, those who are more mature uh, with those who are less mature in their spiritual life and relationship with Jesus. And throughout, he keeps talking about uh, how to deal with those who are weak, uh, those who could easily have their faith damaged to the point uh, where they would lose their faith. And it's not actually until verse 1 of chapter 15 that he actually uses the word strong. Those of us who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. It's okay. You're the more mature. You're the stronger. You're, you have that responsibility to build them up which is the focus of the last half of chapter 14. It says, because this is exactly what Jesus did, which his first point begins in verse 3 of chapter 15. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Quoting from Psalm 69. He didn't please himself. Uh, he didn't come into this world uh, to seek glory. He didn't come in to seek power. He didn't come in to establish an earthly kingdom. Uh, as he tells us in the Gospels, he came uh, to seek and save the lost. He came to serve and to be a servant of others. And his whole ministry is bracketed by those two important events, uh, which before his ministry begins, he spends that time in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, by all the things that humans want. And he denies those to put uh, the will of God, because his mind is focused on discerning the will of God first and foremost, and is able to uh, resist Satan, and he leaves him until, we're told, a more opportune time. Then at the end of his public ministry, we find him now in the garden on the Mount of Olives and that passionate prayer, dear father, if there's any way uh, this can happen, uh, some other way, uh, please let it happen. But every time he concludes his prayer with your will be done. And so he didn't go through his life, his ministry, seeking to please himself, but to serve others. And as part of what he does is he, we're told, he brought us close. And that's an interesting phrase that he uses here in uh, verse 7 as he tells them to accept one another then as Jesus Christ accepted you. And it's the same word he used back at the beginning of chapter 14 for them to accept those who are weak or bring them close. And the word's picture is that you, you grab someone who is far away from you or you go to them and you grab them and you bring them close to you uh, to be in your circle of friends, in your circle of fellowship, in your relationships. And this, he reminds us, is what Jesus did for us. How dare we put any obstacles in the way of us uh, being the body of Christ that he described in chapter 12 uh, because of our own personal wants and our seeking to please ourselves. We should do exactly the same thing Jesus did uh, because that was his purpose. And he goes on to describe Jesus uh, in those verses 7 to 9 as becoming a servant. And those three verses really are the uh, center of this whole uh, argument that he is putting forth, this illustration from Jesus. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. He became a servant. Christ Jesus, the Son of God, became a servant. Uh, 
it's this powerful picture that is painted in Philippians chapter two, which we will look at at the end of our lesson, that he did not think more highly of himself than he should, that he put others first and he became a servant. And the word he uses here for servant is the one that is translated in other verses as deacon. Uh, one is a minister or a servant. The word literally means one who waits on tables. So, you know, think about the concept of that you're, you're sitting there in a restaurant at a table and Jesus comes to you to serve you and to be your waiter. It's just an awesome kind of uh, picture. Uh, it reminds me of a number of years ago, uh, we as a family went to California. We spent some time in around the LA and Hollywood area. And on Sunday, we decided that we would visit the Hollywood Church of Christ. And one of my sons had heard uh, that Weird Al Yankovic went to church there. So the boys kind of went in anticipation and hope of maybe getting to see Weird Al. Well, not only did they get to see Weird Al, but we're uh, being, you know, we've been singing, we've been part of the worship. Uh, they get to the part where they are serving the Lord's Supper. And guess who is one of the servants? It is Weird Al, and he is the one who brings uh, the communion to our row. Uh, the boys are kind of giddy, but don't, uh, they're able to hold it all together. But you know, to think of someone of such celebrity and fame, and yet he was willing uh, in a worship setting just to serve other people in a very humble way. And Jesus was this uh, to the nth degree in being a servant and doing what was best for others and waiting on us. And we are to do the same for each other. And he now talks about more of the why he did this. It was on behalf of God's truth. This is God's plan. This is what God wanted to accomplish. It's been what he has been focusing on uh, since the beginning of time. And that has been revealed to us throughout uh, this letter, this whole history of God's saving action reaching out to humans who have sinned, who have separated themselves from them, and yet he has put a plan in place through Abraham to bring all who will have faith into a relationship, to bring them close to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's confirming the promises. It is the fulfillment of all that has been uh, promised and prophesied through the law and the prophets. And to confirm that, we now we have beginning at the end of verse 9, a uh, quotation from Psalm 18, uh, talking about how we'll sing praises to you among the Gentiles. Uh, from Deuteronomy 32, verse 10, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, and continues on from uh, Psalm 117, and then Isaiah 11, the root of Jesse will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations, the Gentiles will hope in him. This has been God's desire and plan all along. The Jews didn't understand it. Paul's already referred to it as a mystery, which he has now revealed to us through his son Jesus and through his Holy Spirit. And Jesus' very life and his ministry confirmed all those promises and brought them all into fulfillment in his life with the goal of all, not just the Jews, not just the physical descendants of Abraham, but the spiritual descendants of Abraham. They all glorify God because of what he has done. And again, the emphasis throughout Romans has been on what God has done. We do not save ourselves. We do not keep ourselves safe. It is all the work of God through his son Jesus and his Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, what does that mean to us on a practical basis? Well, he's already been mentioning several things as he goes through here. Put the needs of others first. Uh, you don't bear with the feelings of the weak to please ourselves. He says you should please your neighbor for his good and to build him up, not just whatever they want. Uh, and 
happy or to feel better or to even empower bad behavior, but to do what is for his good and to build him up and learn from the scriptures, the lessons that they share with you. And verse four, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So continue to learn from these things. Now remember, these folks, they didn't have uh, the New Testament. Uh, the scripture he's referring to is what we call the Old Testament. And very few people besides the scribes themselves and extremely rich individuals had any of the scrolls with any of the Old Testament books written on. Uh, it was just a very expensive, lengthy process. But they were read from to the people on a regular basis. He's, you know, learn these things. We have a wonderful privilege uh, that we have uh, a Bible that is available to each and every person around the world in just about every language. And more languages are being uh, translated uh, every day. And we need to take that opportunity uh, to study and learn from uh, Adam and Eve and the selfish desire, the decision, and the ramifications that that has in their lives and in the lives of uh, the world around them. Learn from Abraham and his faith, even though he struggled with it, uh, but he hung on uh, from Isaac and Jacob, uh, the one who struggled with God and had his name changed to Israel because he didn't give up. Uh, the lessons from the people of Israel themselves who would be faithful for a period of time and then another generation would become very unfaithful and they would be punished for that unfaithfulness. And so he says, you need to learn from uh, what God has preserved for you, these ancient stories, uh, which truly help us understand God's plan and his will for our lives. And then come to that one mind together. That is Jesus Christ. This is the focus of verses 5 and 6. And God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ. So that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is an older edition of the NIV translates the phrase, uh, spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus. Uh, the newer uh, edition of the NIV, the English Standard Version and the Christian Standard Version all uh, translated along the lines now of, may that you have such harmony amongst yourselves. May there be such a wonder, great harmony among you as you follow Jesus Christ or according to Christ. And literally, the Greek talks about having the mind of one another or the same mind according to Jesus Christ or that of Jesus Christ. And that's the same concept he puts forward in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, that he wants them all to have the same mind. Uh, again, it's emphasized in Philippians chapter 2 where he uses uh, the same words to talk about them being like-minded and have the mind of Jesus Christ. And so we go back to his example. What did Jesus do? And why did he do it? And that becomes the motivation behind what we do. And we try to clear our mind of all the other distractions and focus on what did Jesus do and why. And that becomes the motivation and the guide to how we live. And it causes us to bring each other close, accept one another as Christ has accepted. Bring one another close, just as Christ has brought you close. No matter what your differences are, no matter uh, what level of spiritual maturity you're at, no matter whether you agree with each other or not, bring each other close. That's what Jesus did. Uh, the one who was perfect and brought us who are so imperfect close to him uh, because of his love and bearing out 
the plan and purpose and truth of God in his life so that we can all together glorify God for his mercy. And here's that motivating factor. Why do we want to do all this? Because we're all part of this mission. And that was important to Paul that we understand uh, that even though he was referred to and even he calls himself the apostle to the Gentiles, that he was also uh, still deeply concerned about his own people, the Jews, and he still uh, reached out to them first when he went to a city, and then he would go to the Gentiles. And it's not that there was a mission to the Gent uh, Jews, and now it's over, and now we have this mission to the Gentiles. He says, no, the mission continues, and it's for everybody. Uh, we have several missions that we're involved in at Pine Valley, whether it is the uh, Christian school in Sanadi, uh, Zambia, uh, whether it is uh, feeding the homeless at Good Shepherd, uh, working with the homeless veterans at the Ashley Center, uh, those who are uh, disabled and living at Lakeside Reserve. And all of these are part of the same mission. And different ones of us are involved in different areas in different ways. But because we're putting the needs of others first, uh, we continue in doing that mission and we work together to fulfill those missions and glorify God for his mercy, because without his mercy, uh, we would not be saved and there'd be no need to do any of this other, especially putting others first. We might as well just be selfish, if not for God and his mercy. And so that we can overflow with hope. He mentions hope through this passage several times, but he concludes in verse 13, which is a concluding statement to the, everything he has said since the beginning of chapter 12. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. It's God who is the God of hope and can fill us with joy and peace as we trust in him so that we overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, throughout this whole section, Paul emphasizes the fullness of the activity and involvement of God in his saving work, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have been greatly blessed by that and can give us in the midst of a crazy, messed up, uh, hateful world, joy and peace and hope. Uh, something that we need uh, so desperately each and every day. So as we conclude, we want to make sure that we keep in mind the important aspects of the mind of Christ. It's constantly seeking the will of God. It is humble and loves deeply. It does good and not harm, uh, beginning with our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also to those in the world. And it brings glory to God for his mercy. In everything we do, we seek to glorify God, not to bring attention to ourselves, uh, but Jesus to be servants. And so let us remember uh, this important concept uh, that as we live together, I mean, we allow God to give you the spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ with that one heart and one mouth and glorify God and Father and Lord of Jesus Christ. I mean, he truly summarizes it beautifully uh, in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, remember, Paul was writing to the Roman church uh, from Corinth. And in a few years, he is going to be in Rome under house arrest. And from Rome, he writes to the Philippian church. And he really expounds on this same thought. And so we want to conclude with this uh, powerful picture that he draws here in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, 
Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so, as we come to the end of this lesson, I continue to encourage you all uh, to follow uh, the principle every day uh, in the world, at work, at school, wherever you go, uh, to love does no harm, for love is the fulfillment of the law. And in this current pandemic which we're dealing with, it is not about our rights and our needs. It is about loving others and doing what's best for them. And we seek to do that each and every day. So as we come uh, to the end of our time here, uh, making stop sharing here for just a moment. Uh, thank you for joining us for this class and being part of these classes every week. And we will be bringing this study of Romans to a conclusion over the next couple of lessons. Thank you for being here again today. And may God bless you until we are together again.